we're going to invite you to stand together as we sing. For the Lord is with us. Sovereign over all. We won't fear. We won't fear the Raise your voice now, no love is greater, who can stand against us if our God is for us? Welcome to Faith Community Church. We are so thankful that you are here to worship with us this morning. We're going to sing songs to our great God. We're going to fellowship together. We're going to study his word and hopefully leave here changed people ready to be salt and light in this world that desperately needs it. But before we continue, I just want to give you a few moments to greet one another this morning. with us. We want to extend a special welcome to you. Thank you so much for being here. In one of the chairs in front of you, you'll see a card that looks like this. If you fill out this card, you can take it to the Welcome Center after the service. They have a free gift for you. They'll also invite you into our senior pastor in his family's home for an upcoming lunch so you can find out more about them and more about our church. And if anyone has a prayer request and you want to write it on the back of that card, we would love to be praying for you throughout the week. 
I want to share some highlights with you of things that have happened this past week. We started Summer Crew, a summer crew. And we have a group of about 20 college students that are coming here to the church uh, every single day. They're getting ready for all of the children's summer activities. Uh, so they're getting ready for VBS. They're getting ready for Camp Faith. Uh, and you could be praying for them. Uh, this, they would ha have the energy uh, to do the good works that God has laid out in advance for them to do. Uh, that we use camp and we use VBS simply as tools uh, to share the gospel and so that they would have the energy to, to share the gospel with kids over the course of the summer. Also this past week, uh, I had the opportunity to go to Joe Walker Middle School uh, for career day. And so I got to talk about my career and what I do uh, inside the public school setting. It was super cool. Um, I was able to just freely share what I do and, and answer their questions about why I chose to do what I do and why it's really important to me. Uh, talked about how our life here matters, that we were created with purpose, uh, meaning the decisions we make here have eternal value. I'm able to invite everyone to youth group. So um, it, was, it was a really cool, really cool opportunity. Uh, so thank you to uh, Jim Randall who invited me in for career day and for Joe Walker for having me. It was, it was a lot of fun. This past Friday, Outpost had family night. Uh, so once a month, they have the, it's our young adults, and they say, bring your family, bring whoever uh, to come. They heard from one of our elders, Myron Hawthorne was there, had some snacks, some outdoor worship, uh, just an amazing group. If you want more information about that group, you can come talk to me, or you could talk to Joel Schrader in third service. And then yesterday, Single Moms Fellowship, our ladies' ministry, wants to make a special point of reaching out to those single moms who are just... Uh, doing incredible things for their, for their family. So they got together for a time of, of fellowship uh, yesterday. And there's some photos of that. And then congratulations to the Eberharts, the prou proud grandparents uh, of Ezra. Ezra was born May 16th. Uh, Ezra lives in Texas, but his grandparents and aunts and uncle uh, all live here. So you can congratulate them. In fact, here's an aunt, Aunt Jenna right there. Congratulations to them. Let's enjoy the choir.
Would you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for this day. We thank you for time to be gathered together as your people. God, we remember how just even three years ago we weren't allowed to do this. God, we just thank you for your faithfulness over the past three years and over the past 2,000 years to your church. God, we uh, just thank you for um, the preaching of your word. God, we pray that today that you would prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word, to hear it. God, we pray for Pastor Caleb as he delivers your word. God, we also pray for those who are prevented due to sickness, injury, uh, from being here, Lord. God, we pray for comfort for them. We pray for restoration for them. God, we pray that their hardships would just turn their hearts towards you and towards heaven. God, to a, uh, an eternity with you. God, we just pray that we would just really enjoy fellowship together. God, knowing that this is what we are created for. God, that we would bring honor and glory to you today. God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand. Brethren, we have met to worship. Psalm chapter 139, verse 23 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in an everlasting way. I just want to give you a few moments in our service uh, to just between you and God, just silently uh, pray that prayer. That that you would ask God to search you, uh, reveal things uh, in your heart that need to be confessed, uh, that you would confess those, and then you rejoice in his free grace. Let's spend a few moments and then I'll close this time in prayer. Father, I thank you that you you give us the spirits and you give us your word, not only to convict us of sin, but to empower us to live righteously. Father, I thank you that your forgiveness is free, that your grace is eternal. Father, I thank you that there is uh, nothing that that we could do that could uh, outrun your grace. Father, I pray that we would simply come to you uh, in humility, 
readiness to confess our sins, and then a desire to walk righteously with you. In Christ's name, amen. Come adore his name Sisters raise your hands in praise Lift your hands Taste and see all he's done Heaven to earth has come upon his life joy has gone death has been overthrown mercy is on its throne praise you God oh Lord how, Lord, how majestic is your name you to stand as we continue to sing. Come behold your King. Sinners, come behold your King. Sufferers, rise with hope and see. All is well. He's our new day. Oh, Lord, Lord, how majestic your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, Lord, how majestic your name in all the earth. and all poor, all peaceful and all violent, all fearless, all afraid, all angry, all rejoicing, all doubting, all
singing. Let's read this verse together. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Even the Apostle Paul said, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that is in me.
Yes, I hope my hope is only Jesus. Still my lips shall repeat yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. God, people said, Amen. When I was a high school teacher, I spent much of the first several years sick. Now, you might think that's common because teachers get sick all the time when they start. That's true if you're an elementary school teacher. High school teachers don't usually get sick from their students because what does a high schooler do when they're sick? Yes! I get to stay home, right? Um, I was teaching a unique group of students. I taught primarily honors students. Um, from year one, I was teaching honors mathematics. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but honors students are wired differently. Um, when they get sick, they come to school. Um, and they share everything they have with their teacher. They have questions. They want you to come and answer those questions. And they're sneezing and coughing and everything on you. So I spent a lot of time sick. See, in our society, we understand this. If you're committed to something, you show up. We get that. Attendance is a measure of dedication. That's why Christ tells us through his word to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We are to gather together regularly. Uh, one of the things that's happening right now in the United States is that church attendance is dwindling. People are coming to church less and less. People who attend church are spacing the amount that they go to church apart more and more. And really, I think that it comes down to cultural values. I believe that Americans, as a rule, attach a higher moral value to liberty than they do to loyalty. They're much more concerned about their liberties, about their freedom. Don't, don't, don't give me rules. Don't, don't tell me I need to show up on a Sunday. Don't tell me I need to be loyal. I need to be committed to something. Don't tell me that. I'm an American, I do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. But that's what we value. We value the independence of the American spirit. When you give your life to Christ, you surrender your liberties. You surrender your freedoms. Now, we don't come to church because we're under the law. Because that would mean that we attend church in order to be saved. You understand this. We come to church because we're saved. Because we are a new creation, we need new food. We need a new assembly. We need a new community. And that's what we find here. We gather together weekly, regularly, because we are one in Christ Jesus. And this is the one place where we put that on display for the entire world to see. Do you understand that church is essential? Well, one of, one of the things that ex excited me during the pandemic was that people started saying that. I started hearing people say that. That's something I've always believed. It's something I've always said. And I was excited when I heard people start saying that. But then I realized as time went on that I, I don't think some people knew what the word essential means. Do, do you know what essential means? It means it's something that you can't live without. Like water or food or oxygen or medicine. It's essential. You need it. So, so do this thought experiment with me. Uh, imagine a world where the only location that you could get food for your entire week 
was church. Imagine you had to come to church on Sunday and get all of your groceries for the entire week. That was the only time, that was the only place, there was nowhere else, there was no other time you could get it during the week. Would you show up on Sunday? What, what measures would you take to make sure you showed up on Sunday to get that food that you needed to survive the week? What, what if there was so much pollution you couldn't even breathe the air and you had to have oxygen masks all week long and the only place you could get your weekly allotment of oxygen was at church? To what lengths would you go to to attend church on Sunday to get that oxygen? What if all the world's water was poisoned? And the only place you could get your weekly allotment of water was in the church. How drastic, what, what drastic measures would you take to make sure you showed up on a Sunday to get that water? You say church is essential. Do you believe it? Do your actions match your words? Do you go to great lengths to, a to show up at church on Sunday? Why is it that it's essential? Why is it that we say that? Is that actually true? I'm going to try to show you from God's word today that gathering together with a local assembly of believers is essential to your spiritual life. And I get that primarily from Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. So turn there if you will. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, big context of the book of Hebrews. The major argument of the book of Hebrews is Christ is better. Christ is better. His salvation is better. His covenant is better. His priesthood is better. And what the writer of Hebrews is doing here in chapter 10 is he's showing us his assembly, his gathering is better. This is better than anything else you could do on a Sunday. This is superior. And here's why. Because that better priesthood is mediated through the gathering of the saints. This is where our great high priest ministers to his body. To refuse to assemble is to refuse his ministrations. To refuse his hand reaching into your life, shaping you through his body. We assemble because we have one head. And it's not the pastor. It's not the elders. It's Jesus Christ. And this is the place where he ministers to our body. Now, what I want, you to, what I want to show you there is it's not just we all get together and we've done our bit of good and then we go out. We're getting together for a purpose. Do you see that? The reason I'm putting 24 and 25 on the screen together is because they're all connected. You can't go to Hebrews 10.25 without reading through Hebrews 10.24. The purpose of our assembly is to answer the question, how do we do verse 24? We watch out for each other in order to provoke one another to love and good works. That's the goal of the church. That's the goal of our weekly assembly. And that's what I'm going to show you today. The purpose of our weekly gathering is, to, is provoking love a weird word to use, isn't it? Provoke. But what's interesting is when I, did a, when I did a study on this word, that's a really accurate translation for the CSB. Because in our modern English language, the word provoke usually has a negative connotation, like you're making somebody angry. Yeah, that's actually what this word means. The, the Greek word here is parox usman, and it means to spur one another on. It denotes intense emotion almost always linked with a negative connotation, oftentimes anger or disagreement. Provoke, love, how do those things work? Let me give you an example. Do you remember the story of Nathan the prophet when he came to David after David had sinned with Bathsheba? You remember David thinks he's covered it all up and Nathan the prophet comes to him. Instead of coming out and saying, hey, you're a sinner, you need to repent, he tells him a story. He gets him invested in the story. He provokes him with the story. You remember that? He tells him a story about a man who had one sheep, a lamb. It was his pet. It slept in his bed with him. And his neighbor who had plenty of sheep came and killed his lamb and ate it to serve to his guests. And David was provoked. He was angry. And then Nathan looked at him and said, you're that man. You are that man. He used that to provoke him to what? 
good works, the good work of repentance, the good work of love. And David repented and he lived his life as a man after God's own heart. We are to gather together in order to provoke each other to love and good works. You see, not forsaking the assembly, it's right in the middle of a context. And oftentimes we take it out and we say, okay, I showed up on Sunday. I checked the box. I'm good to go. I did what I was supposed to. No, you didn't. Because not forsaking the assembly is defined in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 as encouraging each other, provoking each other to love. So if you show up and nobody is encouraged or provoked because of your presence, you haven't actually shown up. Listen to Greg Morse, how he describes this. The opposite of neglecting to meet together is not just technically going to church, sneaking in the back and bolting at the last amen. Failing to meet entails not just a failure of proximity, but a failure of encouragement. The writer assumes that meeting together will lead to stirring each other up to loving good works and not just the pastor stirring us up. You stirring me and I stirring you, or in shorthand, we encourage one another as we see the day draw near. Not just the pastor. Do you see that? It's not just me stirring you up. And something I learned as an educator is I'm much more effective is if I can get my students to talk to each other. And what's said is going to remain if it's spoken by you all to each other. That's what's going to help us stick in your head. God's actually wired our brains to work that way. We need to repeat what we heard in order to learn it. You're not stirred up unless you're considering each other. The purpose of our weekly gathering is provoking love. There's three parts to this process. The first part is we do this by watching out for one another. Watch out for one another. That that phrase is translated, watch out. I memorized it in the New King James. It says, consider one another. Consider right there is a better translation. Consider one another. Because the word watch out, It's the Greek word katanueo, and it conveys the concept of careful consideration, thoughtful attention, and deep concern. Careful consideration, thoughtful attention, and deep concern. Watching out is a ministry we do not with our eyes, but with our ears. We're considering somebody. What this means is you're paying attention to them in order to get to know them. What makes them tick? What are they passionate about? What are their struggles? What are their strengths? One of the things I learned as a teacher is that I had the right to encourage my students if I knew them. If I didn't know them and I tried to encourage them, they'd say, who are you? What are you talking about? But to the degree I could share with them in their life, I would get to know them. I'd figure out about their family. I'd find out about their siblings. I'd figure out what their struggles were. I would remember that. I cheated. I would write notes for myself, but I'd come back and I would ask them questions about how their, how their mom was doing if she was sick, how their team did if it was in the NBA finals. Just those little questions lets them know this person listens to me and listening communicates love. This person cares. See, the ministry of watching out is a ministry that's primarily done with the ears. Listen to Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Life Together. It is God's love for us that he not only gives us his word, but also lends us his ear. So it is his work that we do for our brother when we learn to listen to him. Christians, especially ministers, so often think they must always contribute something when they are in the company of others. That this is the one service that they have to render. They forget that listening can be a greater service than speaking. Listening can be a greater service than speaking. Can I, can I talk to the husbands here real quick? When your wife is talking to you, she doesn't want a quick fix. I know, that's crazy, right? Like, why is she asking you all these questions if she doesn't want you to come in and solve the problem? Husbands, the reason that your wife is sharing that with you is because she wants you to listen to her. That's it. It's pretty awesome. All you need to do is really listen. I don't need to problem solve. And oftentimes that's what we need to do with each other on Sunday morning. Oftentimes our primary task is just to be a listening ear, to pay attention to someone. And I mean, maybe you'll need to write down some notes Maybe you'll need to write down their name and write down a few things about them and find them the next week and tell them that you're praying for them and ask them how they're doing. Listen to each other. Consider one another in order to do what? 
to provoke love. So we do this by watching out for one another. This is a ministry we primarily do with our ears. Secondly, we do this by not neglecting to gather. Not neglecting to gather. That word for gather, it's a different word than it's usually used when we see the word gather. Usually gather is sunagage. This is epi sunagage. Epi sunagage. Epi, that prefix, means to, to gather against or to gather at. It denotes a gathering that's at a particular location, in one place. It's emphasizing the locale. In Hebrews 10.25, when it says don't neglect the gathering, it's emphasizing this is a specific gathering at one place, at one time, with one people. It's emphasizing the local church. There's, There's many Americans today who are neglecting to gather together. And I think that part of that, I shared with you before, I think it's because we have a higher moral value for liberty than we do for loyalty. But another reason is we have a very high value for ease. We love ease. Um, Some people say necessity is the mother invention, not in America. Laziness is the mother invention. Think about our inventions, right? I don't want to go turn on the light. I want to talk to it from my chair, right? I don't want to have to, I want to be able to control everything from the ease of my smartphone. Think about this. If somebody gets an electric car and they don't have a way to charge it at home, what are they going to be saving for? A way to charge it at home. Why? Because that's extremely inconvenient to have to go somewhere else to charge your car. Guess what? You can't have church at home. Can't do that. You can't stay at home and have church. You need to gather together with the body. It's not convenient. Church is not meant to be convenient. And in a society that has a high value for ease, they have to push against that desire for ease in order to not forsake the assembling of themselves together. Something interesting. COVID changed church attendance. Do you know that? Um, In 2022, they did a survey and they asked people how COVID affected their church attendance. One out of five people say they attend church less now than they did before. So 20% of people aren't going to church as regularly as they used to. Now, it's interesting that's offset because 7% are saying they attend more. So 7% have increased their attendance. 20% have dropped off. Let me show you some charts real quick that you're not going to be able to read, but you can see some pretty lines on the screen. That, that yellow line right there is people who never attend church. Never attend church. This is from the year 2000 to the year 2022 across the bottom there. So yellow line is people who never attend church. The dark blue line is weekly attendance. You see what's happening with weekly attendance? The number of people who go to church every single week is going down and down and down and down. And the light blue line across the bottom there, that's your monthly attenders. It's holding steady. Only about a 2% margin of error from the highest to the lowest point right there. So, so notice something. Notice that there's a sharp drop off in church attendance for weekly people in a certain year. Do you see it? Some of you might not be able to see the numbers on there, but in 2020, there's a sharp decline in people who attend church weekly. Why? Because the, man, the mantra of the American church became church is not essential. You don't need to gather together. It's just as good at home. You can just stay home and that's, that's going to be okay. And you know what happens when those churches opened again? Nobody came back. Why? Because I can stay home in my pajamas. Because I can turn the pastor down while I'm having my breakfast. Right? This is great. This is ease. We gave Americans what they wanted and they ran with it. You know, it's interesting across the bottom there, doesn't really change a whole lot of people who go to church once a month. You know why? Because they're not really going to church. It's a so- social club. If you go once a month, it's a social club. You're not dedicated. You're not loyal. That's not your family. You're not going there to get something essential. That's not oxygen. That's not water. That's not life itself. That's just, yeah, I show up sometimes. That's the, that's the lukewarm Christian. Jesus is not interested in lukewarm Christian. Here's something in- interesting. Here's something that uh, encouraged me. I just want to share this with you. Here's church attendance trends by generations. You see that yellow line right there? That's the millennials. You see what's happening? That's 27 to 42 year olds. 27 to 42 year olds are going to church at an increasing rate. We see a generation that's starting 
to come back to the Lord, starting to repent, starting to recognize I need this in my life. The next one that's increasing right there is Gen X. And then the one that's decreased down to 2021 and then increased a little bit there is the boomer generation. So, so why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why does it matter that we talk about whether or not somebody's coming weekly? Can't you just sort of show up once a year, Christmas, Easter, call those people creasters? Just, right? You're good to go. Like you, you showed up, you said a prayer, you show up. Why is this so important? Because Jesus said it is. Let's listen to what Jesus says. Matthew 12, verse 30. Anyone who is not with me is against me. And anyone who does not gather with me scatters. You see that word gather right there? Take a guess for what that word is. Sunagage. It's the same word. It's the root word that we see in Hebrews 10, 25. It's two kinds of people. People who gather with the body of Christ. They gather with Christ. That's what you all are doing right now. We're gathering with Christ. We are together in one location with Christ as a local assembly right now. And there's another kind of people. People who scatter. You see, gathering together with Christ is your way of telling the world, he's my Lord. I am dedicated to him. I am loyal to him. Church attendance shows the world where our loyalties lie. My loyalties are with Jesus Christ, not with the world. When I'm more with the world than I am with Christ, that's where my loyalty lies. When I scatter more than I gather, that's where my loyalty lies. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life have distracted me from the one thing that's necessary. Now, be encouraged. I don't actually take attendance on Sunday. Um, and I'm actually really bad at remembering when I've seen people. It used to get me in trouble as a teacher. I would have like two students visit me from the past and I would ask them, were you in school at the same time? And they'd be like, Mr. Schrader, we were in school a decade apart. I didn't know. I just knew I'd seen them somewhere before, right? So I don't do that. My brain doesn't automatically tal tally how often you all are here. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I think. What's, what's important for you is that before the Lord... You go to him and you ask him what that looks like. What does not forsaking the assembling look like? What does demonstrating your loyalty to the body of Christ look like? And then you're faithful to that. That's something you need to work out on your own. This last year, some of you know that I coach club cross country. And this last year, they decided to make a whole bunch of meets on Sundays. And so one of my children, my daughter Tally, is very good cross-country runner, and she has a really good shot at going to the national championship. But she had to run in a certain number of races. And so my wife decided before the season, we have a number of Sundays that she can miss. And if she has to miss more than those, she can't do it. We decided on that. We prayed about it. We came up. I'm not going to tell you what the number is. Some of you are wondering, aren't you? It's between us and the Lord. We decided on that number beforehand. And it came down to the end of the season. She needed to go to one more Sunday to make the national team. I said, no, we already decided. She can't miss it. We already decided before the Lord, this is how many Sundays we are willing to miss in the year. It's going to go beyond that. She can't do it. So she didn't make the national team. She qualified as an individual uh, because a certain number of individuals can also go outside of the team. So she had to run in a non-Sunday race. And on that race, she was able to go as an individual, but she didn't get to be on the team. Why? Because I want my daughter to understand church is essential. The assembly of the saints is essential. One of the things I, I love about the movie Chariots of Fire, some of you are familiar with the story of Eric Little, is the Sunday that he refuses to run in the Olympics, they, they go from the Olympics to a shot of him in church, worshiping the Lord, assembling with the saints. Why? Because church is essential. Now, I've told you that. I've shown you that Jesus taught that. I want to give you seven reasons church is essential. Why seven? Because I want to be thorough. So seven reasons church is essential. First reason church is essential is because gathering together is essential for growth. Many believers are not growing, are not progressing in godliness because they're not gathering together with the body. Gathering together is an essential means of grace, also called an ordinary means of grace. There's three primary ones. You know what they are? Three ordinary means of grace. Three ways that God has said, here's a gift I'm going to give you. If you do this, you'll grow. You know what it is? Prayer, 
reading scripture and gathering with the saints. Prayer, reading scripture, gathering with the saints. Ordinary, easy, simple. Do you know why we don't do them? Because they're ordinary. What do we want? Something extraordinary. Something amazing. Something exciting. That's what we want. And oftentimes, we're so focused on something extraordinary that we don't take up the ordinary means of grace. Listen to how Paul Washer describes this. He says, We live in a day when it seems that everyone in the church is waiting for something extraordinary, a move of the Spirit that will collect, correct all our spiritual maladies in a moment's time and with little effort or cost on our part. Although such an extraordinary revival is altogether possible and should be desired, it is not God's ordinary means of growing his church. Our desire for the extraordinary should never lead us to neglect the ordinary means that God has given us to grow. If you're not willing to do ordinary things like read your Bible every day, pray to the Lord every day, attend church every single week, you're not going to be ready for extraordinary things. You're not going to be prepared for that. See, we get so obsessed with the extravagant that we miss God in the mundane. And that's most often where he meets us. The ordinary, the weak things, gathering together week in, week out with the saints. Do you remember the story of Naaman? Naaman was an Assyrian general who had leprosy. And he had a captive an Israelite woman who was one of his slaves. And she cared for her master. He seems like he was a good man. And she told him that there's a prophet in Israel, Elisha, who could heal you of your leprosy. And so he went to see Elisha. It says this in 2 Kings 5.10, Then Elisha sent him a messenger who said, Go wash seven times in the Jordan, and your skin will be restored, and you will be clean. Now, now notice this. First of all, this general of the Assyrian army, the most powerful army in the world, shows up at Elisha's house and Elisha doesn't even meet him at the door. Sends his servant to talk to the general. and says, oh, go wash in the Jordan seven times. Have you ever been to the Jordan River? I have. It's like a mud pit. It's all muddy and disgusting and freezing cold. And this guy has a leprous skin disease and he's like, go wash in the muddy water. Well, listen, listen to how he responds. But Naaman got angry, left, saying, I was telling myself he will surely come out, stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the skin disease. He expected something extraordinary, right? The prophet's going to come out and he's going to do a miracle and it's going to be amazing. I'm going to wash in the Jordan. That's disgusting. That's ordinary. I got better lakes at home. I got better rivers at home. I'm going home. And his servants say this in verse 13. His servants approached and said to him, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more should you do it when he only tells you, wash and be clean? You know, a lot of Christians think that they would do great things for the Lord. You know what? If the government told us we couldn't have church, we'd show up. We do that. We do that extraordinary thing. What if, what if your bed told you not to show up for church? You gonna stand up to that? What about the coach of your kid's team? What if he told you not to show up for church? You stand up to him? Like we think that we're gonna do these extraordinary things, but we won't do the mundane, the ordinary. Why? Because we have a higher value for liberty than we do for loyalty. That's not who you are. See, here's who you are. You're somebody who desperately wants to look more like Jesus. That's your driving passion. You want to look like him. Sometimes you forget it. But do you know how you can come to look more and more like Jesus every single day? Read your Bible. Pray and show up for church. Ordinary means of grace. Why is church essential? Because gathering together is essential for growth. Secondly, there is power that is only present when we assemble. I'm going to go quickly through these. So if you can't write them down, sorry. 1 Corinthians 5, 4 says, When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Notice the end of that verse. With the power of the Lord. There's a power that's present in the assembly of the saints that's not present in other situations. 
He says, you need to gather together in order to exercise church discipline on this person, to exercise the power of the keys that are given to the church. You need to gather together and there's power in that assembly that's not present elsewhere. Why is church essential? Third, the assembly is the visible manifestation of the mediatorial work of Christ. You know what happens when a bunch of different people from a bunch of different backgrounds get together and they dwell in harmony? The world only has one explanation for that. That's a miracle. That's a work of God. And we know why. Because we have peace with God, we have peace with man. There's one mediator between God and man. Who is it? The man, Jesus Christ. And our showing up on Sunday shows that we have been joined together. Listen to Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. See what it says right here? He took two groups. He's talking here about Jews and Gentiles. He took two groups, Jews and Gentiles, and he made them one. He joined them together. Do you see the means? There's two means. Do you see it in the passage? His shed blood and his broken body. Where is it that we celebrate those means? In the gathering, in the assembly. That's where we participate in communion. And what are we doing? Every time we participate in communion, we're declaring the Lord's death until he comes. We are one because Christ has made peace between us and God and between us and man. It puts on display the love of the community for each other and for their Lord. You can't show that you love your brother without gathering together with him in sweet fellowship. Fourth, the assembly is essential for knowing Christ. The assembly is essential for knowing Christ. You see, God has given you a unique gift and he's given your brother or your sister a different gift. As you come to know them, you come to understand Things about Christ that you would have never known on your own. Do you realize that? We have a myriad of manifestations of the wisdom, of the grace of God in a diverse community. And we need to get to know each other. Why? Because we get to know Christ better as we interact across that diversity. Listen to Paul in Colossians 2.2. 2. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love. Paul says, I want you joined together in love. Why? Listen, this is the reason we need to be joined together. This is the reason we need to be one assembly together so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I have to be joined to other members of the body if I'm going to get that ministry. If I'm going to understand the mystery of who Jesus Christ is, if I'm going to come to know all of these things that are hidden, these treasures hidden in him, there's treasure to be found and you're going to find it by having your heart joined to your brother and your sister in Christ, by entering into fellowship and communion with him. You see, we get to know Christ by getting to know his body. Why? Because fellowship with the body is fellowship with Christ. The local assembly is the only place that you can fellowship with Jesus Christ bodily. Do you hear what I said? The local assembly, the assembly of the saints is the only place you can fellowship with Jesus Christ bodily. Now, understand this. You can fellowship with him spiritually in your prayer closet. And I hope that you have that sweet time of communion with your Lord, with your Savior. And in his word, you fellowship with him. But bodily, you show up on a Sunday, you can hug Jesus. You can look Jesus in the eye. What am I talking about? And as much as you've done it, to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Did you notice that many of the ministries in Matthew chapter 25, where we're supposed to go out, are going to people who can't assemble with us? They're in prison and we do what? We visit them. They're sick and we visit them. Why are we doing that? Because they can't show up here. Because they can't get that fellowship here. L listen to 1 John 1, 6 through 7. Fellowship with the body is fellowship with Christ. I get that from this passage. If we say we have fellowship 
with him, and yet we walk in darkness. We are lying and not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If you're paying attention, verse 7 is surprising. He says, if we say we fellowship with Christ and we're walking in darkness, we're walking in unrepentant, unconfessed sin, we're lying. But if we walk in the light, that means we've confessed our sins. That's the context. You're confessing our sins. As he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's what makes sense. Look at the flow of the passage. It doesn't say we have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Think about it. Verse 6, we don't fellowship with Christ. If we're walking in the darkness, if we're walking in the light, we do fellowship with one another. Do you see the parallel passage there? The whole point is we are fellowshipping with Christ by fellowshipping with each other. The local assembly is the only place that I can fellowship with Jesus Christ bodily. Why is church essential? Fifth, the assembly is an essential outlet for spiritual gifts. God has given every single one of us something to contribute to the community of saints. And our master is coming back. And he's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? And the answer, I buried it in the ground and I never invested in the body, is unacceptable. Now he expects you to use your gift in proportion to your gift. If he gives you five talents, what does he expect? Five talents. If he gives you one, he only expects one. But every single one of you has something to contribute. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know what that is. Oftentimes, the reason people don't know what their spiritual gift is is because they're not active in the community of saints. As you work side by side with the saints, you'll begin to see what your gift is. My gift has to do with exhortation. One of the ways you can identify your gift is you look at the body and you think, why isn't everybody doing that? If your gift is evangelism, you look at the body and you'll think, why is everybody not sharing the gospel? What is going on here? If your gift is service, you're going to think, why is everybody not serving? I don't know what's going on. Why is this happening? Because God gives you a heart for your gift. Now what that means is we learn from each other. We learn, you learn from me how to exhort. You learn from an evangelist how to evangelize. You learn from a servant how to serve. But every single one of us has a gift and our desire to show up on Sunday is to contribute that gift to the body. Do you understand? That's why Paul wanted to go to church. He tells us that in Romans. In Romans, he tells the church at Rome, I want to come to you guys. I want to come. I want to to be in your church. I want to be in your fellowship with you. And here's why. Listen to Romans 1.11. For I want very much to see you, so I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Paul says, I can't wait to be with you because I have something for you. I have a gift that God gave me and it's not for me. It's for you and I want to give it to you. So you can be strengthened and so we can be mutually encouraged by what? By each other's faith. You have the same faith I have. You have the same Christ I have. You have the same Holy Spirit inside of you that I do. Why is church essential? Number six, because our endurance in assembling reveals true faith. Because our endurance in assembling reveals true faith. There are those who endure to the end and are saved and those who bail out and never work. What am I talking about? 1 John 2, 19. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would not have remained with us. However, they went out, so it might be made clear that none of them belonged to us. Listen to me here. Forsaking the assembly permanently means you were never saved. Do you get that? You don't get saved, go to church for a while, get tired of it, get hurt, leave the church, and never come back. There's times of wandering, but every sheep that wanders will come back. It's goats that don't come back. The one who forsakes the assembling permanently never was of us. Now, I read this, and my response is, I don't want to look like that at all. I don't want to even come close to looking like that apostate right there. And so I don't ask, well, how, how close could I come to apostasy without being apostate? Like, could I go seven weeks without assembling with the body and, and still maintain my faith and still stay healthy? Could I do that? Could I get that close to apostasy without becoming apostate? Don't play with fire. And definitely don't play with hellfire. You don't want to do that. You don't want to test 
how close you can come to rejecting God without actually rejecting him. What you want to do is you want to run towards Jesus with all your might. Lastly, why is church assembled, uh, essential? This is the most important because Christ is preeminent. For every single believer, Christ is preeminent. That, that word simply means he surpasses all. He is above all. He is first. He is the head. What's he the head of? The church. Listen to Colossians 1.18. He also is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. Is Christ first place in your life? Could I tell that Christ was first place in your life if I just followed you around for a week? Would I be able to tell by your actions that Christ is preeminent in your life? Why we show up week in, week out, why we do the mundane and the ordinary is because Christ is king. Because he's our head. I don't know how many of you showed up on Thursday night and watched Insanity of God. Read the book. It goes so much more into depth. But it's convicting, isn't it? And here's one of the things that I hope that you received if you were there. Here's one of the things that should really convict you. People all over the world today, as we're sitting here in our comfy chairs, are being tortured. Some people will die today. Some people will watch their loved ones murdered in front of them today. And do you know why? Because they would not forsake the assembling of themselves together. Just take a few weeks off until the, the police aren't going to watch. Just stop going to church. They won't kill you. They won't even know who you are if you don't assemble. Why are you all getting together in one place? Then they can just come in and round you all up together. Why are you doing that? Well, Nick Ripkin told us the answer in that movie. Why? Because Jesus is worth it. Because Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth standing up to somebody who says, you're going to die if you get together for church this Sunday. Jesus is worth it. What, what absolutely broke my heart is that story of communion with four saints in Somalia. And in the book, he explains the reason that they knew these people were Christians is because they had communion with a white man. It identified them. And those militant Muslims in Somalia murdered all four men. Why? For having communion with the body of Christ. It was worth it. Because Jesus is worth it. The purpose of of our weekly gathering is provoking love. There's three parts in this process. First part, you do with your ears. You watch out for each other. You get to know each other. Secondly, we do this by not neglecting to gather. And last but not least, we do this by encouraging one another. So important that you don't try to jump to the third without doing the first two. You're getting to know. You're considering you're gathering regularly. You're demonstrating faithfulness. I care about you. I'm here for you. Week in, week out. And now you speak. And what do you speak? You speak encouragement. Now, let me show you the fuel for that encouragement in the main passage, Hebrews 10.25. But encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Why are we encouraging each other? Because Jesus is coming back. What are we encouraging each other with? Jesus is coming back. Maybe that's your role today in this body. Maybe before you leave, all you need to do is turn to somebody and say, hey, Jesus is coming back. Could be today. That's our passion. And that's what fuels our fire for fellowship. It's Jesus is coming back. And so much the more, what? As you see the day approaching. Jesus is coming back. But let me really quickly in closing, just give you a couple applications there's a couple ways that we do this. First way is you do this by singing to each other. Do you know that? Just showing up and singing on Sunday morning is a ministry to your neighbor. It says this, Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Just showing up and singing is encouragement to the body. Secondly, speaking to one another. There's a negative and a positive here. Ephesians 4.29, no foul language should come from your mouth, but only, you see that this is an exclusive statement, only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. This is what we're supposed to do when we open up our mouth in conversation on Sunday morning. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, therefore encourage one another and build each other up as you were already doing. You know, if 
If you are, don't know how to do that, get with somebody who does. And the way you find somebody who does is somebody who speaks to you and you feel encouraged, you feel built up, follow them around, ask them some questions, watch how they interact. Learn from the gifted people in our body how to speak so that people are encouraged. Listen to Bonhoeffer on this. I love this quote from Life Together. He says, but God has put this word into the mouth of men in order that it may be communicated to other men. When one person is struck by the word, he speaks it to others. God has willed that we should seek him and find his living word in the witness of a brother, in the mouth of a man. Therefore, a Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. Do you have that? Do you have a Christian who speaks God's word to you? When one person is struck by the word, he speaks it to others. Every Sunday, I cover this screen with scripture. Hopefully one of them resonates with your heart. Share it with somebody before you leave. You know why oftentimes we don't share with other people? We think, well, they probably already know. We need reminders. And that's the next encouragement I want to give you. 2 Peter 1.12, Therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you know them and are established in the truth you now have. I think it is right, as long as I'm in this bodily tent, to wake you up with a reminder. We gather together to remind each other. You know what happens when we remind each other? We wake each other up. So look around every Sunday and wake people up. You can wait till after the service. If it's happening in the service, it's good to do it then too. One last passage I want to leave you with. Hebrews 3, 12. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage each other daily while it's still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. I want you to see that word daily right there. In Hebrews 10, he's talking about the weekly assembly, but in Hebrews 11, he uses the same word, watch out, consider, get to know, and he says we need to do it daily. You know what that requires us to do? That requires us to have other saints in our homes. That requires for us to reach out and get a phone number so we can text somebody during the week and see how they're doing with that prayer request they shared with you on Sunday. That means you're connecting. Romans 12 says we're supposed to pursue hospitality. We're supposed to share in the needs of the saints. Are you pursuing hospitality? Is that how you would describe your interaction with other believers? And why do we do that? So they're not hardened by sin's deception. We need each other. I need people who got my six. I need people who are looking out for me, who are calling me out, who are encouraging me, who are speaking the truth to me in love. But that's what I want to challenge you today to do. I want to challenge you to not waste showing up on Sunday because it's a waste of showing up if you don't provoke one another to love. So before you leave today, don't forsake the assembly. I want you to provoke someone to love before you leave. It could just be telling them Jesus is coming back. It could be sharing with them something else from the, else from the sermon that struck you. Now, I'm not going to stand at the door and take an exit ticket from you. My teacher friends understand that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to grade you. I'm not going to have you turn in homework next week. But here's what I want to remind you of. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth you having an awkward conversation. Jesus is worth you opening up your mouth and sharing scripture with somebody. Jesus is worth your obedience. Let's pray, Lord. We thank you for your beloved son delivered for us so we could be rescued from the kingdom of darkness. Lord, help us to live as a people who love your appearing, who are longing for your return. And Lord, I pray that that would be reflected in our fellowship here, in our community here. Lord, we are not a people who forsake assembling. Lord, it's such a blessing for me to be part of such a thriving community that shows up week in, week out so faithfully because Lord, we love you. Lord, help us to remember it's okay to remind people of things they already know. Lord, I know that this passage is popular and so many people know it. And so I pray, Lord, that you would just stir us up by way of reminder today. I pray this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward as we worship the Lord in our giving. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for the blessing of community. I thank you for the blessing, the privilege of being a part of the body of Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in our offering here, Lord, that you'd use it for your glory, for your renown. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
While the men are taking the offering, I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, one is the CareNet fundraiser started last week. Um, are there still bottles out there, Curtis? Oh, there's a couple bottles. So you can still grab a bottle. Um, if you brought one home, let me remind you, bring it back on Father's Day. Please don't bring it back until Father's Day because then it'll just get lost somewhere on our church campus because like we'll be cleaning one year and we'll find some random bottle full of coins. So bring it back on Father's Day um, and we'll give that to CareNet. Um, also, we are having a taco truck fundraiser today. Um, that's from 11 to 2. It's in the basketball court area. Um, so after the service here, you can go out there. A portion of those proceeds go to our children's ministry. This is separate from the barbecue. So the barbecue is going to be later on in the summer. So some of the kids have sold tickets for that. This is a separate fundraiser, just to confuse you and me. Um, we're doing some baptisms next Sunday. We have baptism every service. If you've never followed the Lord in obedience, taking the step of baptism, um, we'd love to invite you to do that. Um, you can contact Jason at the church office if you want more information about that, but that'll be happening next Sunday. Um, also want to let you know that next Sunday is our annual summer barbecue kickoff. We'll be doing this over at Desert Sands Park. Uh, it's going to start at five o'clock and we invite all of you to come on out. This is a great time for us to fellowship, to consider each other. We need to spend time together. And that's one of the things we do during the summer. Every Sunday evening at Faith, all throughout the summer, we have fellowship time. And really that's a ministry of the ears. That's a ministry where we get to show up and encourage each other. Um, we're going to be having a going away party for the Kornoff family Thursday, June 1st. You, wanna, you might want to write that down. I noticed this morning it's not in your monthly bulletin. So make sure you write that down June 1st. That's in two weeks. It's going to be here at the worship center. We're going to do a potluck dessert. So bring a dessert to share from six to eight. There's no signups. We're just inviting everybody to come out and just honor the Kornoff family with us. Um, and then Prime Timers Karaoke Night is Friday, June 2nd. This is for the Prime Timers only. I see some of you getting excited out there, Charlie. It's not for you. Unless you come maybe disguised as a Prime Timer, they'll probably let you in. Um, but that's going to be June 2nd at the Gondas house from 4 to 6. You can see the address in the bulletin. I'm going to ask you to stand as Jonathan comes and close our service in prayer. Close our eyes and bow our heads and reverence some God. Thank you, Lord, Father God, for our blessings. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. It's the only reason why your sins are forgiven. Lord, Father God, please pour the Holy Spirit on Faith Community Church as we are able to provoke love as we assemble together as a church. In Jesus' name, amen.